Good morning. It is Sunday, the 5th of September, and welcome to another week in lockdown, our third. I think we're all hoping this will be the last one, but you just don't know how this is going to go with this Delta variant. So even though we've dropped to level three and we can get our favorite coffee or fast food burger, um, we're still here. So really glad you could join us and let's take a moment and pray. Loving God, thank you so much for being our God, even in these hard times. But we're grateful that it is spring. We're grateful for all of our body, young and old, the doubters and the cynics, those searching, those hungry and thirsty, and those who have loved and walked with you for many years. God, for any of our members that are sick, for any guest that is tuning in for the first time, ask your blessing and your favor. For each of us, God, would you encourage us and lift us as we step out in faith, gathering together, trusting you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to engage with God's word. And I want to start with a poem. It's by a fellow named John Rodell, who Barbara discovered and is sharing some of his poems with the church, different members of our church, and she gave me one that fits today. I think it also it fits our experience. So sit back, have a listen. Hey God, hey John, I can't get over how sad I'm feeling today. You aren't ever going to get over that. What? I'm not? No. You're just wasting your energy trying to avoid your sadness. Your emotions aren't a wall that you can just climb over or dig under. They are a tunnel that you must pass through. You don't get over how you feel, you go through it. There's a big difference. Will I survive? Of course. Just cross the threshold of your heart and walk right in. However, while you're going, in, you must keep moving forward. Be careful not to get stuck in the doorway. It's easy to just stop in your sadness and not move. Let it come. Experience your sadness. Embrace it. Listen to your heartache. Learn from it. But keep moving. God, I'm proud of you. Being vulnerable to how you feel takes tremendous courage. Exploring your heart is a feat of courage. It's an epic undertaking. Be bold. Charting the unmapped wilderness of your heart is your life's odyssey. Don't be afraid. Go through your sadness. Go through. Your emotions are a door. See what is waiting for you on the other side of heartache and sorrow. Don't get over go through and you'll be standing in the sun again. It will be a great adventure. <laughs> Pause from the poem. That takes a lot of courage to enter into sadness that way. Back to the first person. Will you be waiting for me on the other side of my sadness? God, no, me, why? because I have been holding your hand the whole time. I will meet you at the door and we will walk through together. This doesn't have to be a journey. You take alone. Your sadness is my sadness. Your tears are my tears. Your sorrow is my sorrow. This is our journey. Take my hand, come on. Let's go through the passage of your heart together. Me. I, I, I'm trembling. God. That's how any important journey is supposed to begin, isn't it? Look, this is a sermon where I'm supposed to talk about the stresses of lockdown. But that poem is applicable to so much of life members of our congregation who've lost 
dear members of their family and close friends that are like family. Others who are struggling financially or their relationships. Others who have moved and left those they love and miss them tremendously. But this lockdown kind of brings it all to bear, right? I chose these two passages for lockdown three for a reason. You see, the first uh, one I want to just spend a moment on is the Matthew 6 passage. Jesus starts talking about praying and being real, being authentic, not trying to impress anybody or impress God, but be straight up. And then he talks about how we give and treat others. And, and the little secret there is that we're a whole being and we don't just think or just feel or just act or just experience in our body, but we're a whole being. The Western Greek mindset, which Western civilization is so built on, separates that. Medical doctors, psychiatrists, therapists, all of these different parts of what it is to be a human. Life coaches to help you take steps and plan. The Hebrews knew that that's not how God created us in these black and white boxes with these dividers between all of this. They knew that our actions were part of our being, were part of our saying, were part of our feeling, were part of our thinking. We are a whole person. And Jesus, author of creation, was really clear. When you pray, be real. And then he talks about how we behave as a result of prayer. And then the second part of that gospel, he gives them the Lord's Prayer, which Anglicans and Catholics say every time we're together, it's the rules. I don't know why it's the rules. Not that it's a bad idea, other than that we've kind of lost some of its uh, impact. We, we stop considering, we kind of go numb to what we're actually saying. But this prayer is about us more than it is about God. We think of it as an 0800 call to get God to do stuff, but it's really about us aligning our mind and our heart with God. Us being in the right place to relate to him and each other and others. You see, the disciples, when they ask for this prayer, teach us to pray. You have to understand that first century Jewish culture and these lads, plus those around those lads, men and women, they had 613 rules, which included prayers for everything. Prayers to get up, prayers to go to bed, prayers before you eat, prayers after you eat, prayers before you work, prayers when you leave home, prayers when you return home, prayers when you have an important conversation. They had prayers for everything that they knew by heart, because they had done them their whole life. And I expect with 613 of those, they kind of just all blended into one. It was all part of that Old Testament way of showing us that even with 613, we end up knowing that there's some kind of distance between us and God. So as disciples, of a rabbi. They're watching him and they saw Jesus escape off by himself regularly. And he would come back and when he would teach and spend time with them and engage and interact on holistically all of life, not like life over here, teaching about God and the kingdom over here, they could see something different. There was a way he talked about and related with the Father that made him thirsty, hence them being Jesus' disciples and later apostles. And so they knew there had to be something when he went off by himself more than the 613 prayers they were accustomed to. They did extemporaneously pray. They did listen to God, but there was something in his prayer. So they wanted to know. And as good disciples, students of their teacher, their rabbi, they would 
naturally ask him to teach them. And so he gave them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, acknowledging who he is. Your name is holy. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May the behaviors and the values, what is your goal in redeeming creation, may it become true here and look just like it does every day in heaven and so forth. So that prayer of honesty and real relationship, we can think, this isn't about me asking God for something. This is an act of me getting aligned with God in right relationship, which requires trust with God. The other passage was Psalm 6. It's not a long psalm, 10 very short coupled verses. This psalm was written by David, and it was written by David in a very difficult time. It actually is the first of seven. There's something with God in the number seven. And I really enjoy this first one. I, I saw some books that are actually, and some versions of the Bible where there's little notes. And these notes, I actually think are really shallow because it's talking about a Psalm of David when he was physically sick. And, and when you study this text, you're missing something if you limit this to being physically sick. It's an acknowledgement of a whole human being, mind, body, strength, spirit, heart, one holistic being of a person, and a prayer of lament of pouring oneself out. In our Western Greek culture, we want to deduct, okay, you should tell God exactly how you feel and tell him all these ways. And not realizing that this psalm, when you're aligned with God and you're in right relationship, you've moved your mind and your heart to be in sync with God. You feel safe and welcome and invited to pour yourself out and express yourself where you really are your fears and your exhaustion, your exasperation, your, your heart's feeling like it wants to lose hope. But the Psalms always return back around and close with a choice to praise God, acknowledge who God is and trust him. And that's this little Psalm that you heard read. This Psalm has, these seven Psalms have been part of Lent since the first century. <laughs> So they were part of worship. In fact, the, the notes around these and what we know of these psalms is that they were actually not written specifically for individuals, but for a community of faith, a body, a congregation, a church to use liturgically, to use in their gathered, organized worship. Think of that. Psalm 6 was to be used in a corporate collective worship of a body of people to and with God. In this time when we've got a pandemic and 19 wars plus the chaos going on in Afghanistan and a pandemic and lockdowns in New Zealand, this could be a prayer that's for all of us to pray together. And it could be a prayer for an individual and so I'm, I'm encouraging you to use this psalm as something you pray yourself, but also one that we as a body pray together even today. And a model in a way and a reminder for you individually to take with you and pray as you lift up all of these things that we don't have a container big enough and we don't have the omnipotence and omniscience, the power and knowing of God to deal with all of these global big issues and, and, and challenges for us in New Zealand. So David starts, Oh, Yahweh, God's personal name, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. So 
There is the safety to come to God, but also the acknowledgement that God is God. And he's saying, I'm not trying to be presumptuous. I'm not attacking. I'm not accusing. I'm coming to you humbly with, with what's aching my heart. He continues, be gracious to me, O Yahweh, for I'm languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. That languishing is an emotional term. He's talking about his body's troubled, but also they, so th there's that connection that, you know, when we're really weighed down by something, it physically weighs on us. It weighs on our outlook and our perspective. Our emotions take a sag. Our energy takes a sag. Our will takes a sag. But this verse, this second verse, this little couplet, be gracious to me, Yahweh, for I'm languishing. Heal me, Yahweh, for my bones are troubled. This is a cry of God, come find me. I'm alone and I don't know how to go forward. Verse three, my soul also is getting troubled, but you, Yahweh, how long? That's not even a complete sentence. My soul is greatly troubled. My, my, this is so big and I'm one holistic person that this is impacting even my trust and my faith in you. I'm feeling challenged on the edges and pulled by the circumstances I'm facing. But you, Yahweh, substantive blank, how long? Maybe Jews are actually Kiwis. That substantive, start the sentence and the substantive blank, the silence fills in what everybody knows. But you, Yahweh, you're the one who can deal with this. No one else. How long? Don't make me wait too long, Lord. You're God. You rescue me. Nobody else can. He continues. Turn, O Yahweh, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. So David's going, look, this is bigger than me. It's bigger than me as a person. It's bigger than us as a worshiping community. This is your credibility to the world, your credibility to your people, and your credibility to the world. God, deliver me, save us, because that's your character and who you are. Act in your character, God. Be true, be faithful. Save us. Verse five, for in death there is no remembrance of you. And Sheol, who will give you praise? For in death there is no remembrance of you. And Sheol, who will give you praise? Real simple, our lives are short. If, you, if, if not now, when? God, you're the God who rescued your people throughout history, even when we haven't deserved it. And we don't deserve it any more than anybody else. But you're the one who rescues, and you've got to do it in this life. Don't wait forever. We know you are bigger than us, bigger than the situation, bigger than our lifetime. But God, would you move now? God, please move now. Verse six, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. Emotionally exhausted. Verse seven, my eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. If you've ever had real loss, not ordinary loss, not even loss for this year, but the loss that is permanent loss and there's deep long-term grief, that heaving, sobbing grief, you've probably cried to the point where it felt like you had sand under your eyelids and a lot of it. And that's the kind he goes, I have grieved so deeply and so long that it feels like my eyes are failing. It's an emotional and a physical of a person who's exhausted in grief. Verse eight, 
Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. So David is going from worship and talking to God to talking to whatever tangible opponent or crises or situations being faced. Whether it's a people who are intent on hurting him or them, or it's a pandemic, something we can't control, we can't convince to stop, we can't solve ourselves. So he's turning to this challenge, to this enemy, as well as speaking to his own heart, as well as speaking to the hearts of his people. He's saying, the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. In other words, we're not forgotten. We're remembered. We're heard. God told Moses when he was in Egypt, after he had left and gone out into the desert, had the burning bush experience and went back. God told Moses in that season, I've heard the cry of my people. Their crying has come up to me and I'm sending you to rescue them. The angel, Archangel Michael told Daniel in chapter 10 of Daniel, the moment you prayed, God sent me, Michael the Archangel, So God is listening and God is attentive and God hears. I've memorized the prayer called the breastplate of St. Patrick. It's two pages long, many verses. And one of them is, I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead. His eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need his wisdom to give me speech. You see, God is watching and God is listening. He's not asleep. He's not not paying attention. And we can often feel like that when we're facing real challenges. So David's reminding himself and the people of God and enemies Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for Yahweh has heard the sound of my weeping. The, verse 9, the Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. I prayed, God accepts it. He's taken it and he's holding it. And it's not a considering of yes or no. He's heard our cry and he will act. Sometime that act isn't within our immediate rationale and understanding, but God uses it. David's saying, I'm satiated, I'm at peace because I'm confident, I trust that God hears me. And finally, verse 10, all my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. You see, he has every confidence and he ends his prayer. This is that Lord, where are you? I feel so alone. I'm exhausted. I'm crying and no one's responding. But I know you're God and you hear me and you're going to act. There's this choice of returning to a place of trust. So God is giving us permission with this psalm, encouraging us, inviting us, calling us to be honest and really grieve and to move into the place to get our hearts and our minds right, just like the Lord's Prayer, back to a place of trust and let God be God. So what do we do this? During COVID-19 Delta variant lockdown 2021, stage two, alert level three. We could freak out. We could turn to some coping mechanism that actually doesn't help at all. It's just a numbing or distractive agent. It's look at the shiny object over here. It changes nothing. It doesn't heal us. It doesn't transform us. 
it doesn't fix the problem. But I heard a fellow in public yesterday talking about, no, he doesn't do mindfulness. He drinks like normal people. It made me laugh. Confession. But he actually was acknowledging that the drinking doesn't fix anything. It's just a coping mechanism to get through it as if it changes or does anything. But that's what the world does. The world keeps acting like it's got it all together. With 19 wars, a pandemic, an elite few who control over half the world's wealth. And I'm talking few. I'm talking a few thousand people who own over half of the world's wealth in a world filled with seven plus billion people. A world that is facing economic challenges, living on borrowed money, an ecological crisis. And it's saying you don't need faith. Suicide is a valid option. Coping mechanisms, alcohol or pot or are all valid. So we could follow that stream of thinking, or we could remember who gives us seven invitations and calling, urging, exhortations to be honest with him and realign ourselves in trust with him because he's the God who moves and acts. If we're going to do the latter, which is kind of what I'm encouraging us to, a few fast things. We're on this journey together. Some people go to a church, their church, because it does this well or that well. Children, youth, music, teaching, life groups, whatever. But they subscribe to it because they get the dopamine hit of they like and are affirmed and encouraged by that thing that they're drawn to. And if they stop experiencing that dopamine hit or somebody else did that better than their church, then they would leave and go to that church. They approach God and being a part of God's people. They don't stop and think about this. Like a subscription to a newspaper or a magazine or a movie channel or, or, or. As long as it's good and in and I get what I want from it, notice the eye. I'm a part of this body. As long as everybody's like me and it's easy and then I'll be a part of this body. But when it gets hard or something goes wrong or I don't get my dopamine hit, then I'll look to another body. And that's not what we're called to be. We're called to be a people together on a shared journey. This psalm isn't to individuals. It's to the community of faith, to God's people. So is the church across different expressions of the church. Orthodox, Coptic, Catholic, Anglican, Baptist, vineyard, micro churches and houses, one church. We need to recognize that we're one people on a shared journey. A kingdom people, ambassadors, priests, the fragrance, the body, light, salt. And we're on this together. And you don't check in and check out because you don't get what you like right now. And we are St. Christopher's. We're one body and we are far from perfect. And we got a lot of issues. And I think most of us would say most of how we do what we do right now isn't where we would really like to be and where we're heading. But we're one people and we're in this together. The young ones are in it with the old ones who want organ and 400-year-old hymns. The old ones who like the organ and the 400-year-old hymns are in it with those who are in their 50s and 60s who remember the charismatic renewal and want those choruses. Both of those groups are in it with the young ones who want a very different kind of music, worship music played by different instruments, some different ways that we belong to each other. And let's pause using music as our apply all across all of what it is to be a people together. Who cares when a song was written? Who cares what instrument 
It's played by who cares what the tempo is. Sure, we have our preferences of music styles, but we belong to each other. This is our family and we worship together. Let's do all of those versions and more. Let's encourage each other and sing with each other. The way we worship, the way we do life group, the way we work in ministry. Let's be a people who understand and identify ourselves as a body that is inseparable. You can't pull the kidneys out and do well together. The psalm is calling us to go through even the toughest stuff together. To remind each other to love and trust God and wait on him together. And that we're transformed and discipled by one another. Second, we're holistic beings. We're a holistic church. We're holistic humans, individuals. Our feelings, our perspective, our hopefulness or helplessness, our physical health or illness, our energy or lethargy, our determination and drive or waning courage, our thoughts that we take control of or don't take control of, our emotions which come and go up and down here and there that we either take control of or somehow without thinking about it, think we're actually enslaved and have to react to what our emotions do and say. And our hope and trust in the world, living like practical atheists with the same values in decision-making process as the world, or we're a people of God who trust God. Because even if we don't understand what he's doing, we know who he is and we trust him together. And we remind each other together. But as individuals, as a human being, you're a person that is physical, is mental, is psychological. And, and I differentiate those mental being what we think and, and psychological, how we process what we think. A cynic, an optimist, hopeful, discouraged, etc. So our minds, our thinking, our bodies, our literal physical health. You've seen people who get down and their bodies get sick. I always break out, even right now, I'm sitting here scratching my finger because it's spring and my body starts experiencing eczema and it experiences it on this finger and on this finger. And I get this eczema because of allergies. My body responds. When I get down or I get stressed, the eczema comes in the same places. That stress plays itself out through my body. My emotions come and go up and down. our drive, our drain. You're a holistic person. We're in this lockdown, and in this lockdown, we face some challenges that we may think, no, I'm doing fine, no, I'm doing fine. And then you start picking up on how your body's handling it, or how your emotion's handling it, or how your patience is handling it. And I wanna encourage you to be cognizant of you being a whole person and where the stress in this lockdown may go or come from. Remind yourself that God hears us and God is acting. Remind yourself that we are God's people and he hasn't forgotten about us. And even though we're in this stressful time, we're going to be together again. We're on the South Island. We're very fortunate. And it won't be long, and it's springtime, and the days are getting longer, and the temperatures are abating. And even though we don't have the answer to this, we know that we're his people, and we're sent to this place at this time for a reason as his people. So, hopefully next weekend we'll be together. If not next weekend, the next, and I think the lack of control makes it worse. So, keep praying. Get in the word, let it wash over you and teach you and shape you. Pray, reach out to one another, 
phone, video. Somebody dropped flowers off to us today. Somebody dropped off another gift to us last week. It, it's been lovely, and we've been doing the same. Keep loving each other and being there with one another. So that's everything for us today. Go with his blessing and enjoy Sabbath. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And have a real Sabbath. Rest your mind, your body, your heart, your burdens, your responsibilities. Rest to each other and rest to God. Be together and recharge the whole you. So go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. We go in the name of Christ. And hopefully we'll be together real soon. Father loved Bye. us first.